stable coins are there, but if uh, stable coins are the killer app of crypto, what have you done? You complain about fiat currencies and you have recreated fiat. And uh, stable coins have all the problems of fiat. If there'll be the basement of fiat currency, stable coins are not going to do any better than fiat. So I don't think that fiat is the way to go. I think that something provides you a stable, backed by real and financial assets, hedge against inflation, is a useful asset to tokenize. That's what we're doing. Joining us today on Speak Up with Anthony Scaramucci is Professor Noriel Rabini. He is a renowned economist uh, from NYU. He's a now a professor emeritus. I hate saying that, Noriel, because it implies you're old. And you and I know how very young you actually are. Uh, he's been on the time. I have gray hair. Great. Well, that's you're doing better than me with the gray hair category, but I could always introduce you to my colorist. But, but you, you've been on the Time 100 list. You write for the Financial Times, Forbes. You're a winner of the CoinDesk Top Mind Awards. You've, you've served in the White House and Treasury Department. Your most recent book, which I'd like to talk a little bit about, which is an awesome book called Mega Threats. Uh, you also wrote a, a book about the economic crisis in 2008, which I uh, greatly enjoyed. Uh, you've been called Dr. Doom in the past because you correctly assess the global financial crisis in, in 2008. Uh, but aside from all those things, you're just a really amazing friend. Uh, I brought you on because uh, you possess shaman-like powers uh, when it comes to predicting markets, and I want you to do some of that for us today. So tell us what you see happening in the world. Give us a sense for where you think the economy is right now and some of the things you're worried about and some of the things you're optimistic about. Yes, uh, always a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, you're also a great friend and I have great respect for all the great things you've done and your success. Um, when we talk about the global economy and the various regions, I think that we have to separate uh, the short term, the cyclical kind of cycle uh, from the medium long term trends. Uh, in the short term, of course, the debate is soft landing softish landing, hard landing, no landing, what's going to happen to inflation, to growth, to central banks and the stock market. And you have to differentiate between US, Europe, Japan, China, and emerging markets. Over the medium long term, we have to think about what are going to be on the positive side, the impacts of technologies in the future, starting with AI on the positive and on the negative on what in my most recent book, I called mega threats. There are some trends that are more medium long term that are going to lead to lower growth and higher inflation. So let me focus for now on the short term. I would say there are four scenarios that people have been discussing. One was uh, the one of the soft landing where US and other major advanced economies has reached back uh, inflation of 2%, not this year, but say by the end of next year, uh, without having any recession. That will be the Goldilocks uh, immaculate uh, disinflation scenario. Second one will be one of a softish or bumpy landing where you do achieve that goal, uh, but with a narrow, short and narrow recession, short and shallow, uh, say two quarters of negative economic growth. Might not make a big difference between the two, but it does in two aspects. If you have a bumpy landing, the stock market will have a correction for a while. And secondly, that's going to affect... Uh, the political outcome, and we have a big election coming this year, and whether Biden or Trump is going to win, assuming that these are going to be the two candidates likely, is going to depend on how well or how poorly the economy is going to be doing. So those are the two main scenarios. There are another one of a real hard landing, recession and financial crisis, that uh, when there was a spike in oil, energy, and commodity prices after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, looked possible. And when there was the problem last spring with the U.S. banks and then some European also looked like a risk, as of now, that risk of a real hard landing is out of the picture. There's another scenario, especially for the U.S., no landing, where in spite of the Fed hiking rates, uh, the economy could still grow uh, above potential. Inflation would then not fall as fast as the Fed wants. And in that scenario, uh, interest rates will not be cut at all this year. 
and that will be a negative for the stock market. Now, I would say hard landing and no landing probably are not very likely, and therefore we are left with a soft landing and a bumpy landing. Uh, for the U.S., uh, the surprising thing for the U.S. has been how resilient the economy has been and how resilient even the stock market has been in spite of now the Fed saying that uh, rates are not going to be cut anytime soon. You remember a few months ago, uh, the markets were saying the Fed could cut up to 162 basis points. Uh, this year, the Fed was telling us, no, there'll be only three rate cuts. And then uh, the results about uh, the economy, strong growth, the latest results about inflation have dashed the market expectations about uh, rate cuts. Right now, rate cuts for this year are being priced around maybe 80 basis points for the year. This is not very different from what uh, the Fed is telling us. And the market were expecting the Fed to start cutting rate in March, but instead now the market expectations have aligned with something that the Fed is signaling, that they are not going to see cuts until uh, June at the earliest. Now, the interesting thing about it is that you would have expected maybe that this uh, uh, expectation that the Fed will not cut as much and not so soon would hurt the stock market, even if, of course, a, a soft landing is good overall for the market. And so we are for the U.S. for now in a baseline of a soft landing. Uh, what has happened is that in spite of uh, rate cuts being postponed to further out and less than what market wanted, the market has actually rallied further significantly because, of course, of the uh, of what has happened to the Magnificent Seven. If you exclude those seven stocks from the S&P 500, uh, the rest of the market has done fine, but of course not as good as the Magnificent Seven. So what has been driving essentially the market higher, in spite of rate cuts being uh, are later and smaller, has been the outperformance of these uh, of this tech stock because of all the reasons uh, we know about. So that's for the U.S. In Europe and the Eurozone and the United Kingdom, economic growth for the last few quarters has been between epsilon positive and epsilon negative. Uh, it is effectively already a bumpy landing. Uh, it's not a severe recession like the one who would have occurred after the shock to energy prices because there's been resilience and the Europeans have found the ways of finding reasonably cheap energy from other parts of the world when the energy supply from Russia uh, was cut off. So the bad news was the economy is weak. The good news that compared to a severe recession would have occurred otherwise, you know, the economic growth in the Eurozone is flat, but the unemployment rate so far is still low and job creation has been uh, good. Uh, of course, the euro has underperformed relative to the dollar and European stocks have been underperforming relative to American stocks because of the tech stuff. And, uh, and most likely at this point, given the weakness of Europe, uh, the ECB is going to start cutting rates sooner and slightly more than the Fed this year. And that uh, shows up in the current weakness of the Europe. But we're essentially in a bumpy landing, but not, not really a severe contraction. Uh, finally, China. China is in more of an, a structural uh, slowdown. Potential growth in China is at best for the rest of this decade. 3% might be lower for reasons I could discuss. This is not cyclical, it's structural because of demographic, because of state capitalism, because of a lack of a social welfare state, because of the policies bashing the uh, the private sector by Xi Jinping and so on and so on. Uh, but that means that China is not going to be a main engine of global growth. If anything, the country is going to be well and outperforming China for the rest of the decade is going to be India, where potential growth is closer to 7%, potentially higher if they do more reform. So for the last 30 years, uh, uh, China uh, has been the, the rabbit and the uh, and uh, India was lagging behind the air. Uh, those roles have been reversed. But of course, the baseline from which India is starting is much smaller, and therefore the impact of stronger economic growth by India on the global economy is not as significant as the slowdown of China. So, so we're in a soft landing for the for the U.S. We are in a bumpy landing for Europe and UK. We are in a bumpy landing from China. 
and the rest of the emerging markets depend. Some of them have better fundamentals are doing well. Some of them are actually very fragile and they'll have severe debt and financial crisis. But none of the major ones will have a severe financial crisis. Folks, it's an amazing summary. I want to, I'm talking to you from uh, beautiful Abu Dhabi. So behind me is the Arabian or the Persian Gulf, whatever you like to call it, depending on where you live, call it something different. Uh, you're getting the 6 7% growth here as well. Uh, and I, I guess what I'm wondering is about the West and the sustainability of economic opportunity and growth in the West relative to other parts of the world, like some of the parts that you've mentioned, uh, India. So, so are we up against it in the West because we just have too much deficit spending? Are we up against it demographically? Uh, or is there an opportunity in the West perhaps that uh, I'm not exactly seeing relative to places like the one I'm talking to you from, Norio? Yes, you're right. Uh, you know, the Gulf is doing well because they have all lots of natural resources. And in places like Abu Dhabi and Dubai, they've actually invested it intelligently to diversify growth uh, in other sectors. Saudi Arabia is trying to do the same thing. All of them have a vision, 2030 or so plan, to move away gradually from natural resources and fossil fuels. We use that oil wealth for investment in other things. Uh, to different degree of success, but positive. Um, you know, uh, most emerging markets are fragile, but uh, none of them is going to have a severe financial crash. Uh, about the West, I would say uh, there are two forces. One is uh, more positive, and the other one is more negative. I recently wrote uh, actually an op-ed that was titled uh, uh, Artificial Intelligence, versus human stupidity. Because I said, we are in some sense in the best of all world because AI and a number of other technologies of the future are going to imply stronger potential growth, stronger productivity growth, and greater human welfare, living longer and healthier. And that's going to be actually, those innovations are going to start mostly in the West, especially the US, and only in part in emerging markets, say China. Uh, so uh, we are in this best of all worlds because technology, like in the past, can increase uh, human welfare, per capita income, economic activity. But we are also in the worst of all worlds uh, because of uh, what they call human uh, stupidity, but these bad policies. And that bad policies are the type of mega threats that I've discussed in my recent book. Uh, there are geopolitical rivalries that we can discuss at my slow down economic growth and fragment the world. Uh, there is, of course, climate change that can be eventually damaging of economic growth and raise cost of production. Unfortunately, COVID-19 is not going to be the last pandemics. There is aging of population on one side and migration massively from potentially from south to north and poor to rich, in part because of climate refugees, in part because of economic and social and political collapse in some fragile states. Uh, we have this backlash against uh, liberal democracy and democratic capitalism because of rising income and wealth inequality. Uh, and that leads to populism of either extreme right in many parts of the world or extreme left, like we've seen uh, recently in Latin America. And we have another range of uh, economic, monetary, and financial risk. The risk of higher inflation and lower growth, stagflation. The risk of deglobalization, de-risking, decoupling, fragmentation uh, of uh, having balkanized global supply chains as we emphasize uh, economic security over economic efficiency. And that protectionism is going to be negative for economic growth and is going to cause higher inflation. So there are on one side stagflationary forces that are this mega threat that imply lower growth, higher cost of production, call it stagflation. And there are other forces, technology, that imply lower, sorry, uh, higher economic growth and lower inflation, but a good disinflation, a good deflation. A deflation is coming not from lack of demand, but rather by increased supply of goods and services. I would say over the short term, the next 10 years, I worry that these mega threats are going to be more important 
But if you can face these threats and resolve them, probably 10 years from now, the impact of a technological innovation is going to imply another productivity revolution. So there is hope in spite of demographics, politics, geopolitics, environment, health, you name it, that this may be a better world. And actually technology, if it's used intelligently, because technology can be used for damaging purposes, could help us to resolve some of these mega threats. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting because we, we set up a whole slew of worries. And then the good news is the forces of technology improve the society, right? You and I grew up with peak oil theory, and many thought we were going to run out of oil, but then look at all the great tech that led to fracking and all the innovation in terms of exploration. Um, I want to switch to something that we both know a lot about, and you know, I think we differ on, you know, and this is something that, uh, uh, one of the reasons why I love talking to you, because I think we are at in intellectual sim simpatico often, but sometimes we're at intellectual odds with each other. We very famously debated each other on crypto at the FII conference here in the Gulf in Riyadh a few years back. What are what are your thoughts now on Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies? Um, do you see wider adoption? Do you think that this is, as Jamie Dimon believes it is, a uh, pet rock or a Ponzi scheme? And then tell us a little bit about the blockchain initiative that you have going in your business. Yeah, you know, as you know, um, I've been skeptical, you know, of crypto and we have respectfully disagreed on it. I think that even those that uh, believe in crypto uh, agree that certainly in advanced economies, but also most emerging markets, uh, these are not going to be real currencies. And so calling them cryptocurrency is a misnomer. They're not a unit of account. They're not a scalable means of the payment. Uh, they're not really a stable store of value. They're not a single numerator. So if you know anything about monetary theory, calling them, uh, uh, you know, currency is a misnomer. And they're not going to be widely used for means of payment, frankly, unless you had really high inflation advanced economies. And even some of the pessimists like me think inflation might go from two to five. But you need very high inflation for having a process of replacing fiat currencies with something else. Now, some of them imply that there may be some uh, store of value function for it. Uh, people say Bitcoin is limited in supply, and that uh, may lead to eventually higher price. That's fine. Uh, I'm skeptical of that, but if it happens, so what? Uh, you know, there are $100 trillion of, uh, <clears throat> of assets, uh, real financial, real estate, whatever in the world. Suppose one of them is that. Uh, suppose that for some uh, blockchain-related uh, technologies, people are going to use Ethereum. Fine. But, you know, there were 20,000 ICOs. Uh, about 80% of them were a scam to start with. Another 17% have already gone to zero. Of the remaining 600, even the top 10 from their peak have fallen uh, 20, 30, in some cases 60, 70%. So, you know, compared to the internet, uh, people said this is going to be like the internet. It doesn't look like the internet. And while I believe there'll be a financial services revolution because traditional legacy systems have the problems we know, I'm much more of a believer that uh, the revolution in financial services is going to come from fintech that is not really based on blockchain. It's based on AI machine learning, big data collected by sensors, Internet of Things and using then 5G and 6G in the future is going to provide the means of payment, credit allocation, asset management, insure tech, and you name it and so on. And there are thousands now of firms that are fintech and not to do with blockchain uh, that provide uh, you know financial services with revenue and with profits. Uh, so I'm more believing that being disruptive in the long term. Now the blockchain technology itself may have actually some validity. There may be uses. Uh, it might be useful. I don't think it's going to completely change the world. Uh, people believe that everything is going to be on the blockchain. Uh, frankly, again, that's not happening and unlikely it's going to happen. But it's a technology that for some usages it might be actually useful. You know, I've been involved into an initiative that is based on essentially uh, providing a 
tokenization of real and financial assets. My critique of most of uh, crypto is that it's backed by nothing. And if it's backed by nothing, uh, you cannot say what is fundamental value. But suppose that we worry, as I do, about the rise in inflation. And we find a set of assets that are protecting you against inflation. And the traditional defensive asset, as you know, was long-term treasuries. But in a world of higher inflation, a long-term treasury is a defensive asset. When equities do poorly, it's going to do poorly, like it did when rates went higher and two years ago and bond prices fell 20% when the S&P fell only 15%. So you need an alternative to long-term treasury. It's a combination of gold, short-term treasury, tips, and various types of sustainable real estate. Take this bundle of assets, create an ETF, create an index, create whatever, and then tokenize it. So you have an asset that is backed by real and financial assets. It provides uh, much better returns than traditional fixed income. It's a hedge against inflation, the basement of fiat currencies, against political and geopolitical risk, and again, against even environmental risk. And does well in good times, and there's a convexity when there are bad times. That thing that is tokenized as a value that you know every day and every moment, because these are all liquid assets, is backed fully by that. It's not a stable coin, because uh, its value fluctuates daily, but it's what uh, people like Armstrong and others have spoken about, is a, uh, is a flat coin, something that actually provides you a return that is positive aligned with inflation. So I believe that that's something that actually is useful to have and to tokenize. Stable coins are there, but if uh, stable coins are the killer app of crypto, what have you done? You complain about fiat currencies and you have recreated fiat. And uh, stable coins have all the problems of fiat. If there'll be the basement of fiat currency, stable coins are not going to do any better than fiat. So... I don't think that fiat is the way to go. I think that something provides you a stable, backed by real and financial assets hedge against inflation is a useful asset to tokenize. That's what we're doing. Okay, well, listen, I love, I love your strategy, which is why I wanted to bring it up. And you are using the blockchain technology as part of the strategy. And... Uh, and you know it's fluctuating, but it's a it's a core group of great assets that would 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 hedge against inflation. And so, before I turn it over to questions from our audience, I I want to ask you about our thirty four trillion dollars of debt and the growth of that debt. It looks like the CB, CBO is saying the Congressional Budget Office is saying whether it's a Democrat or a Republican. The spending is not going to stop, and it looks like the deficit will be roughly five and a half to six percent of the GDP uh, for the next three to ten years, if not longer. And uh, is that sustainable, Noriel? And if it isn't sustainable as an investor, what would you? Yeah, do? it's a very valid point. Then, and on top of um, public debt in the U.S., also you have a large stocks so of. Uh, private debt, actually the sum of private plus public debt today in the U.S. is about 420% of GDP. It's higher than it was during the Great Depression and higher than it was uh, at the end of uh, World War II. And today we're not in a Great Depression and we're not uh, at the end of a major global war, when in those cases, of course, debt goes much higher. Uh, it's huge. It's eventually not sustainable. I think on that one, people will agree. And you're right on the politics. When Democrats in power, they tend to spend more, but uh, they're not able to raise taxes uh, to pay for it. When Republicans are in power, they love to cut taxes. They say they're going to cut spending, but they're unable or unwilling, and therefore you, all, you have always deficits. Uh, now, uh, why has not yet become unsustainable? It's not become unsustainable because in an emerging market, when you have a lack of fiscal discipline, there is market discipline. You punish by having your currency falling in value, your sovereign spreads going higher, and then you have to adjust. Same thing even in advanced economies like Greece, Italy, even the United Kingdom, where fiscal policy goes in the wrong direction, you're beaten up, and you're forced to change policy. 
The problem with the U.S. is that paradoxically, our benefit, this exorbitant privilege of being the global reserve currency that is used, the dollar still as a major global reserve currency, it's a benefit because on one side allows us to finance ourselves cheaper and longer. Not only our fiscal deficit, but also our current account, our trade and external deficit. We can finance them bigger and for longer and for cheaper. But the problem with it is that exactly because there is no market discipline for the U.S. dollar, then the market is going to give us even more rope to hang ourselves. And eventually, when these things and will eventually become unsustainable, the crash is going to be even more severe. So we're postponing the, the doomsday, but eventually that's going to be occurring. What's going to be trigger? We don't know, but it could be that in the next decade, the trust funds of Social Security run out of money, and then we have a crisis because we cannot pay uh, the benefits uh, with the current uh, payroll taxes. That could be the trigger. Or it could be like last year, people starting to worry about the deficit being unsustainable, and then you start to see some market discipline when, for a short period of time, 10-year treasury yields went towards 5%, and they could go even above. So you need something of a trigger. Now, in other countries that borrow in a foreign currency, like emerging markets, or even a Eurozone country that uh, cannot print money by themselves because the ECB does it for them, then the only option, if your debt is unsustainable, is to default. You have seen it in emerging market, you've seen it in the case of Greece. The advantage of US and other advanced economies that will borrow in their own currency is you don't have to formally default. If you have an increase in inflation, like it happened in the last couple of years, the real value of long duration fixed income goes lower and therefore your debt to GDP ratio falls. So you can always use what's called the inflation tax to get yourself out of your problem. And I think that's more likely. You're not going to see the US defaulting. That's why I'm actually pessimistic and I believe that the average inflation rate is not going to be 2%. It's going to be more 5 plus in the US because eventually the stock of private and public debt is going to imply we're not able to cut spending or raise revenues and taxes, then the only part of at least resistance means to monetize it and to have surprise unexpected inflation wiping out that debt. It is still a tax, but it's the inflation tax, a more sneaky tax because uh, it's not even legislated by Congress. Yeah. And it's also current. It's creating a lot of political dissension, though, too, because people feel a lower standard of living in the middle class or the lower middle class because their dollar is being devalued as a monetized debt. And so in some ways, it's it a is. Sort of a regressive tax. Um, and, and so this uh, this is worrisome. And I think it's going to have a, a worse than expected impact on the political landscape. We're going to get more firebrand oriented politicians and you know, more nastiness as a result of this. But we're going we're gonna to take some questions now, if you don't mind. And uh, the first one I'm going to handle, because this is more of a military question, it's about the thrift savings plans. Uh, would I be correct to believe that the G fund and the F fund will be more inversely to each other? And the answer to that, Michael, uh, and this is Luke Air Force uh, based on firefighter, the answer to that is correct. And so we like the G fund after... Our team examined that uh, more than the F fund in a scenario like that. But we do appreciate the question. Let's take another question. This is uh, a little bit more for you, Noriel. Uh, for years, the market has been affected by the tactic of indexing and a shift to growth. Has this decoupled the market from capital flow valuation structures to its own addictive racetrack? It's interesting because we talk about the Magnificent Seven the 493 lagged the Magnificent Seven. What do you say to David from New York, Noriel? I think there is a validity to that argument that since a lot of the investing has become passive investing following indices, as opposed to active investment that requires to do some valuation analysis, uh, it's possible that at least over the short run, even... Uh, poor performing company uh, may be actually lifted or not fall as much because of uh, 
they are part of passive in, uh, passive index. So people say in order to have proper both market discipline and proper valuation, you need to have active investors that are stock pickers rather than being passive investing. So I think that that's true. But of course, over time, where there is a significant gap between uh, uh, those valuations driven just by passive investing and the underlying fundamental, the market corrects itself. So I think uh, in the short term, it might be true, but I don't think that passive investing implies that uh, uh, valuation can be totally decoupled by fund from the fundamentals over the medium long term. All right, let's take another question. Worried about the decline of the dollar. Okay, this is apropos to what I was talking about. This is Thomas from Florida, uh, thirty-four trillion dollar, thirty-four trillion dollars of debt, researching Bitcoin, uh, thinking about putting some of his money there. Okay, so I'm a pro Bitcoiner. Noriel is against Bitcoin. What would you say to Thomas? Um, I would say that um, if you're asking yourself, at least in the last few years, whether Bitcoin has been a hedge against inflation, I'm not sure that that's the right hedge because in the two years when inflation was uh, rising sharply, Bitcoin actually was doing poorly. It went from a peak of 69 to 15. So now that inflation is falling, uh, Bitcoin is going higher. So Bitcoin to me looks like not an uncorrelated asset uh, to say equities, but is actually even more correlated uh, than uh, than equities to the economic cycle. You know, when equities go much higher, Bitcoin that tends to do even better, especially in times where the Fed is either cutting rates or expect to cut rates. While in times where the market is going down, either because there is risk off or there's a risk of a recession or the Fed is uh, tightening rates, the stock market falls but Bitcoin falls uh, even more so. So it's more volatile than the market. It's not yet be proven that it's a hedge against inflation. It might be some broader diversification asset. I don't fully understand it. But if you're really worried about the basement of fiat currency and inflation, as I said, a basket that includes uh, short-term treasury, tips, gold, uh, maybe some other precious metals, maybe even food uh, and some of the uh, transition, uh, decarbonization uh, metals, the green metals, and maybe types of uh, uh, real estate, that may be a basket that provides you a greater hedge against inflation than Bitcoin itself. Okay. Okay. Well, listen, it's a, this, the, the, the show is about our guests and our fans. And so I'm going to let you have the last word on that, Noriel, although I tried not to let you have that last word in Saudi Arabia a few years back. Let's go to the next question. I, I know your views on Bitcoin, and I expect <laughs> that you're very smart. And Bitcoin right now is closer to 60 again. So, you know, yeah. well, I mean, look, one can recognize it, it, that. But to your point, sir, it is a volatile asset. And so I tell people if they're using it, very, very small allocations to Bitcoin, until it, it until it matures and becomes more adaptive. Well, let's go to the next question. That is, Some, someone learning about crypto. Where does one invest the first five hundred? If one has a fifty thousand or more traditional investing, so I'll take this. It's a. I would just go into IBIT. It's dollar sign IBIT, which is the BlackRock Bitcoin Trust. But I, uh, you know, this is ge generic financial advice, not specific Mary from Illinois. And so I would just caution people, as I always do, very small allocations of this sort of stuff. Let's go to the next question. Your opinion about cryptocurrency, how much influence do you believe BRICS will have over the next five years? So you've already shared your opinion on cryptocurrency, but tell us about the BRIC nations and their currency situations uh, relative to the U.S. and whether or not they'll be more involved with crypto. Like the country of El Salvador? Um, uh, you know, there was a lot of hype about a decade ago about the BRICS, a combination of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. There may be other country added now to the BRICS. They can talk about BRICS+. 
On the economic side, actually, things have been uh, disappointing. People said they're going to grow so much faster than advanced economies that they're going to, unquote, become a much larger share of global GDP. But think of this country. Uh, China has gone from a growth rate of 10 to 5 to now potential of 3. Russian growth, even before the war, was at best uh, potentially 1.5%. Now probably is barely above zero because of the consequence of a growth, potential growth as opposed to what's happening this year. Uh, Brazil has always been the country of the future. People say they have all the resources, all the potential investment, but their average growth for the last decade has been between 2 or 3%. It doesn't seem like it's breaking out of that one. South Africa, same problem. There is a minimal amount of political instability. It has natural resources, but there's lots of bottlenecks of infrastructure, starting with electric grid, uh, barely growing 2% per year. And the only really success story has been India, where growth has gone from 5 to 7. But the share of global GDP of India, it's, uh, it's uh, very small. Now, so probably... Uh, and by the way, these countries are very different economically. Some producer of services, some commodities, some manufacturing, some democracies, some autocracies, some export oriented, some not export oriented, some close to US and some of them being rival of the US. So there's not going to be common economic policy by the three. It's a very non homogeneous group. And China, India are strategic rival within this group. I don't think that these countries are going to massively adopt crypto. In China, is forbidden, even if there are ways to have access to it. India has been also skeptical and has really developed sophisticated fintech solutions where they, their payment system actually used by over a billion Indians and allows you to do payment very, very cheaply and very, very efficiently. Uh, they, the amount of adoption of crypto in the other BRICS has been really modest. And all of these breaks, by the way, for now have relatively low inflation. They've been actually quite successful in keeping inflation low. And crypto usually probably is a defensive asset when you have really runaway inflation. You know, not 5%, not 10 but we go to 30 50 100 uh, You know, like in places like Turkey, like in some Latin American countries, and so on and so on. So I would say among the BRICS, I don't see any of them being a high inflation country anytime soon, while some of the weaker and less credible emerging markets uh, uh, may be. But even the country where people say they have adopted crypto, yeah, they have adopted it as legal tender as Salvador. But if you look at the adoption of crypto for actual means of payment and transaction, it's really tiny. So yes, they have crypto on top of their own currency, but uh, it's not as if crypto is a significant means of payment. It's not at all. And that is a country that actually has made uh, crypto legal tender. So if you are uh, a store and somebody wants to pay you in crypto, you cannot say no. The adoption is really minimal. All right. So, so, so Noriel, I always love talking to you because you have such a balanced view of everything. I'm going to finish this up with my last question, if you don't mind. Uh, what are you working on now? Uh, two best-selling books. You've got this great new product. Do we have another book coming? Are we going to see another book from you before the World Cup comes to New York? What's well, that? usually I write uh, one book every decade. It was Crisis Economics around 2010, now uh, Mega Threats. Because if you want to say something big and important, uh, I think that uh, you have to wait. You cannot do it every year and so on. So, you know, I follow the economy, I follow the market. I would say that, you know, in my mega threat books, there was only one chapter about a utopian future. So there was a happy ending, but it was only seven pages in a world in which everything could go wrong. I now recognize that uh, technology can change the world for the better. Uh, but it's not just about AI. I think there are about 12 or 14 industries of the future. And some of them are AI related. Some of them may not be like, you know, the big revolution, say, in energy is not going to be renewable uh, because it's too slow. It might be fusion. If fusion does occur, we resolve climate change because we'll have unlimited amount of zero emissions energy at cheap prices, 
is a new technology that is not yet there, but 10 years from now may be really the, the killer revolution that saves us from climate change. So there are lots of other things happening that are positive. The caveat about technology is you can use it in a good way or in a bad way. And the risk of AI are one, misinformation, disinformation, deep fake, electoral manipulation. And I worry we're going to see some of that already this year. Two, there's a risk of permanent technological unemployment. Three, there's a risk of uh, increasing income and wealth inequality rather than reduction. And four, uh, there's a risk that actually uh, it makes even our own species over time sometimes obsolete. And the, also the risk that, uh, that uh, AI is going to be used to build bigger weapons to find bigger wars. So we have to control the uses it to make it successful. So I'm trying to think uh, deeper on these issues. That's why I wrote this piece on artificial intelligence versus human stupidity. And I think it's going to be a tension between technology and mega threats is going to be the one that you have to think about deeper to see what has going to happen to the world. I don't have yet a book, but that's a big issue that I'm thinking about for the next few years. Okay, well, I, I really appreciate you coming on, and these are phenomenal thoughts for our viewers and listeners. And guys, please go to wellbeyond.com uh, backslash speak up if you have questions, comments. We're obviously always looking to improve the show. Uh, our next guest is going to be the legendary Dan Moorhead from Pantera, uh, who obviously has one of the larger crypto hedge funds. We'll be discussing uh, crypto, but also the macro situation, which I think is super important leading into the 2024 election. Uh, we appreciate you joining us uh, here on Speak Up. Professor Noriel Rabini, thank you. And I'm looking forward to seeing you live at some point, Noriel. It's been too long.